focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio today, we have our usual Wednesday reporters in Handan and Yoon Hae-jung. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Good evening to you guys. We're going to start things off with North Korea issues. We know that uh, with uh, the U.S. and South Korea holding their first uh, NCG meeting and also the USS Kentucky uh, nuclear uh, ballistic capable submarine uh, coming to the port of Busan, there was going to be some sort of response from North Korea uh, in some way of provocation. We did see this, North Korea having fired two short-range ballistic missiles into the EC early this morning. Again, this is an apparent protest uh, against Seoul and Washington's latest moves to boost U.S. deterrence against the North. Tan, you're going to start us off. Uh, let's get the latest on this. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said North Korea fired two short-range ballistic missiles into the East Sea from Sunan area in its capital Pyongyang between 3.30 a.m. and 3.40 6 a.m. this morning. The missiles flew some 550 kilometers before splashing into the waters, and the South Korean military is looking into further missile details with the U.S. intelligence. Japan also confirmed the launch, saying they landed outside Japan's exclusive economic zone. The Joint Chiefs of Staff condemned the launches as acts of significant provocation that harms peace, not only on the Korean Peninsula, but also in the international community and as a clear violation of UN Security Council resolutions. It added it'll maintain a firm readiness posture based on capabilities to respond overwhelmingly to any North Korean provocations. The SRBM launch came just a week after North Korea test launched a new solid fuel type ICBM. It also followed, as you've mentioned, the inaugural meeting of Seoul and Washington newly formed nuclear consultative group, uh, which was held yesterday. The two allies discussed ways to bolster the U.S. extended deterrence commitment to using the full range of its military capabilities, including nuclear weapons, to defend South Korea. During the meeting, the arrival of a nuclear-capable submarine, the USS Kentucky, uh, at a key naval base in Busan, was also unveiled, effectively stoking North Korea's fear and anger. Uh, it marks the first port call by an American nuclear-capable strategic submarine in over 40 years. And President Yoon Suk-yeol boarded the submarine this afternoon, becoming the first uh, South Korean president to do so. He sent out a strong warning to North Korea, saying Seoul and Washington will overwhelmingly respond to North Korea's advancing nuclear and missile threats uh, through the NCG and also uh, regular deployment of U.S. strategic assets assets on the Korean Peninsula. Earlier in the day, the presidential office held a security monitoring meeting led by Deputy National Security Advisor Im Jong-duk, analyzing the strategic implications of Pyongyang's latest SRBM launch. Korea's two rival parties, meanwhile, made one voice strongly condemning North Korea's latest missile provocation. But the two sides blamed each other for the heightened inter-Korean tensions. The ruling People Power Party slammed the opposition party's adoption of a new peace initiative, calling it the continuation of the previous government's uh, quote-unquote obsession over fake peace, while the main opposition Democratic Party blamed the Yoon administration's hardline North Korea policy for the escalated tensions. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I mean, the peace initiatives uh, that was under the uh, liberal, I guess, Moon administration uh, worked temporarily, but there, it had its limits, right? It definitely has its limits uh, because uh, you also have to get the U.S. involved. And you know that with even before uh, President Yoon uh, took office as he won uh, the presidential elections, uh, we knew that uh, President Yoon was going to take a much hardline stance on North Korea matters. And so either, either way, there was going to be a lack of dialogue uh, from North Korea. And uh, despite, you know, South Korea, we, South Korea can do all they can uh, to try to bring back North Korea. But it's all really all up to uh, the United States at this time. Uh, but amid North Korea's advance mentioned, uh, advance mentioned in its uh, missile developments, a U.S. think tank projected the North will deploy its fuel-type ICBM soon. Uh, Tan, tell us more about this. Well, North Korea successfully uh, conducted a second flight test of the Hwasong-18 solid-propellant 
ICBM last week, which demonstrated its maximum range capability of over 15,000 kilometers if flown on an operational trajectory. And this is uh, easily enough to reach anywhere in the continental United States. And U.S.-based think tank 38 North analyzed that this latest achievement shows that the Hwasong-18 is nearing operational deployment, which, given the North's past patterns of development, could be announced soon, or perhaps after one or two more tests. But it assessed that the deployment won't be a game-changer and will not substantially boost the North's ongoing ICBM threat to the U.S. Yeah, this uh, Hwasong-18 uh, ICBM is an interesting one because there, I, I believe it was tested before and I believe there was one or two times that it failed. Right. Uh, they were saying that it, it, it just didn't uh, work and it just kind of went midway and then just kind of splashed into the ocean and so forth. And uh, for this one, it does seem like it was a successful launch for North Korea, which only indicates that they are getting closer and closer uh, to really having a final uh, keep fully capable Hwasong-18 ICBM. And again, uh, the concerning part about this is the fact that it's not uh, liquid fuel, it's solid fuel, which makes mm-hmm. it so much easier for them uh, to not only uh, move the ICBM around, but to have it ready very, very quickly is uh, the benefit of using these uh, solid fuel ICBMs. Uh, of course, amid the heightened tensions between Washington and Pyongyang, uh, there was quite a bizarre incident uh, here, uh, where a U.S. soldier crossed the border from South Korea to North Korea willfully. You have to understand, willfully and without authorization. And this is according to the U.S. Department of Defense and the way that it was done. It was a little bit weird here. Uh, we are getting more and more information about this particular U.S. service member. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Hejong, you're going to tell us more about this. Well, according to U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on Tuesday, an active U.S. service member willfully crossed the inter-Korean border into North Korea without authorization. Currently, the soldier is believed to be in North Korean custody and his safety and well-being is still under investigation. Now, Taeyong will have more on who this man is and how he ended up in North Korea. But according to the United Nations Command in Korea, he is a U.S. citizen who crossed the military demarcation line while on a group tour to the Joint Security Area in the Demilitarized Zone. Now, regarding this incident, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said in a press briefing that, quote-unquote, we believe that he is in DPRK custody, so we are closely monitoring and investigating the situation and working to notify the soldiers next of kin and engaging to address this incident. White House spokesperson Karine jean Pierre also reaffirmed during a briefing that a U.S. troop crossed the border voluntarily and without any authorization and that the Department of Defense is currently reaching out to their North Korean counterparts on this matter. Now, this suggests that the Pentagon is communicating with its North Korean counterpart through the U.N. military command in charge of the Joint Security Area at Panmunjom, where the incident occurred. The spokesperson also added that the White House, Department of of Defense, the Department of State, and the UN are working together to get more information and resolve the situation, and that President Joe Biden has been briefed on the incident, and this is certainly something that the president is watching very closely and will be kept updated on. She also mentioned that they cannot confirm the involvement of any specific individual in this matter, such as Kurt Campbell, coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs in the National Security Council, who is currently in South Korea for the nuclear consultative group. Also, State Department Press Secretary Matthew Miller said that the State Department has not reached out to the North Koreans or other governments and that it is their understanding that the Pentagon has reached out to their counterparts in the DPRK and added that the safety and security of any American overseas remains the top priority for the United States. Again, a a very unusual case here. Uh, This is, of course, not the very first time that a U.S. soldier, uh, of course, uh, 
fled to North Korea. I believe he is the seventh, but uh, got the news uh, this morning and there was more and more information in regards to this. And it's just the way that he was able to I guess, cross the border into North Korea. There was a lot of questions into this, how he was even to, able to join the tour program at the Joint Security Area in the uh, border village of Panmunjom, uh, given this uh, circumstance that he was actually being sent back to the United States. Uh, they had escorts take him in through the security area, and I believe because after the security area, the was around. But let's kind of do a run through on who he is and what we know so far in regards to this uh, soldier. Well, the soldier, uh, the details of whom have not been officially confirmed by the U.S. government due to the sensitivity of the matter, is believed to be a 23-year-old private second-class U.S. soldier named Travis King. He has quite an unusual history during his military service as part of the 1st Armored Division in Korea. He served nearly two months in a South Korean prison on assault charges and was released on July 10th after serving his time. King had been transferred to U.S. military police by South Korean authorities following the assault incident and was due to be sent home to Texas, where he could have faced additional military disciplinary actions and discharge from the service. According to Korean officials, he was taken to the airport on Monday, a day before he crossed the border into the north. But he was only escorted, like you said, to as far as customs because the escorts were unable to accompany him to the gate. Now, this is believed to have provided him, him a chance to run away from the authorities. He did not board the plane. Instead, he escaped the airport and later joined a tour of the Korean border village of Panmunjom. And during the tour, he bolted across the border, which is uh, lined with guards and often crowded with tourists, on Tuesday afternoon. Witnesses say he laughed out loud while crossing the demarcation line. But it still remains unclear how he was able to join the tour of the joint security area in Panmunjom or how he spent the hours between leaving the airport on Monday and crossing the border a day later. Given that the tour program is mostly pre-reserved and has a strict identity verification process of visitors before entering, it's widely believed that King may have thoroughly planned the escape to cross the border to the north in advance. The JSA is uh, the most recognizable part of the DMZ and tours of the area are open to the public and organized by the United Nations Command, which secures the area. But unlike most of the heavily fortified zone, the actual borderline between North and South Korea at the JSA does not have a physical barrier. Tour guides there chased him right away but failed, uh, and he's now believed to be in in North Korean custody. King became the first American detained in the North in nearly five years. The detained part is, I mean, it's, it's asterisk, right? I mean, the, the, he is technically detained. I'm sure North Korean officials are going to question him and uh, detain him and so forth. And it's interesting what you mentioned about how he started laughing because I saw an article earlier this morning uh, this is from the Daily Beast, and uh, the title reads, the headline reads, uh, U.S. soldier Travis King reportedly cackled, ha ha ha, before <laughs> fleeing into North Korea. And so he, I don't know if he took this as a joke or he really thought he's getting away with it. Um, obviously, you know, he's probably going to face a uh, dishonorable discharge, right, uh, which is going to impact his employment uh, in the United States and so forth. There was a, a chance that he might spend some more prison time. But I... Again, not the first U.S. soldier to defect to North Korea. He is the seventh. I think uh, some of the more notable U.S. soldiers to defect after the Korean War, for example, I believe uh, uh, Private First Class uh, James Dresnok, I believe was his name, back in 1962. Uh, he lived in North Korea for a long time. He married a North Korean woman. He had kids. Uh, I believe uh, he spent his like entire life be, being a, a, an actor, right? That he represented the evil Americans in those movies that they come out in and so forth. And so, again, uh, we don't know what's going to happen so far uh, as the U.S. State Department and the Defense Department said, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, Department of Defense said that they're trying to contact their North Korean counterparts, get some kind of information. But I'm sure uh, North Korea is going to use this as a propaganda saying that, look at this, North Korea is so much better to live compared to South Korea and 
and the United States, and uh, he might be treated like a king. We'll have to see. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, we'll move on here. Japan's TEPCO said that they will disclose real-time information on the Fukushima contaminated water that will be released into the ocean. Hejang, let's get the latest on this. Right. During an online briefing for Korean media, which took place yesterday, Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, the operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, said that it will disclose various data related to the discharge of contaminated water into the sea in real time on its website. The real time data will include information such as radiation monitors at the seawater intake for dilution, as well as monitors at the outlet of the Alps, the advanced liquid processing system, treated water transfer pump, and the flow rate and tritium concentration of the Alps treated water. And according to TEPCO, the IAEA is also preparing a similar website to disclose this information as well. TEPCO officials also said that they will create a special page in the existing contaminated water discharge online portal to disclose the discharge situation in an easy to understand manner through real time data. Now, this special page, which will show real time data graphics, will reveal information such as the status of the Alps treated water and the status of dilution and waterproofing facilities. Now, TEPCO's decision to disclose such data is understood as a measure to respond to the negative public opinion in Korea over the discharge of the contaminated water. In the online briefing, the Japanese government official said that the IAEA has concluded that the Alps treated water's radiation impact on people and the environment is negligible, introducing the conclusion of the IAEA's comprehensive report that the discharge of the contaminated water from the Fukushima plant meets international safety standards. The official added that the IAEA has committed to engage with Japan on the release of Alps treated water before, during, and after the release, which will provide greater transparency and reassurance to the international community. But when asked about the specific timing of the discharge of contaminated water, the Japanese government said that they will make a final decision after thorough discussion, and they didn't have a specific process set just yet. And regarding the South Korean government's request for the participation of Korean experts in the inspection process of the water discharge, there is no definitive answer, and a Japanese government official only mentioned that discussions are underway. Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, it's uh, inevitable now that uh, the release of the contaminated water into the ocean is going to happen. Nevertheless, uh, you know, again, like you said, there is no mm-hmm. definitive uh, Date, uh, timeline just yet on when it's going to be released, but they're assuming that it's going to be sometime uh, in August is what they're saying. And so at least to quell the concerns of some South Koreans, I guess, having the South Korean experts. And I guess in the house right now that the uh, the current administration, the current uh, government is has much better ties with the, the Japanese government at this time. And there is a better chance uh, that uh, maybe South Korean experts will be included in the uh, the list of, uh, I guess, experts who get to check out uh, the, the, the contaminated water that's going to be released into the ocean. Uh, let's move on here. Some interesting reports coming out. A document that revealed the list of members of Japan's Unit 731 was found. Now, this unit, very much notorious branch of the Imperial Japanese Army that conducted lethal experiments on Korea, Chinese, and Russian war prisoners uh, during the Second World War uh, as it sought to develop chemical and biological weapons. Tan, uh, let's get the latest details in regards to this. Well, according to Japan's Kyoto News Agency, a researcher named Seiya Matsuno at Meiji Kakuin University's Peace Research Institute found the document. It contained the names and information about thousands of members of the Unit 731 uh, that conducted inhumane experiments on war prisoners, better known as Baruta here in Korea. Baruta means a log in Japanese. The document, published in September 1940, listed unit organization, names and military rankings of the members. More specifically, the names of 97 military officers were unveiled, including the commander Shiro Ishii, as well as other uh, others dispatched from medical schools who were labeled 
labeled as specialists. Captured war prisoners were brutally dissected alive or mobilized for bacterial infection or frostbite experiments by Unit 731. And for our listeners with a weak heart, I suggest you uh, mute your device for a few seconds. Uh, I am about to give a very graphic portrayal of what uh, might have happened down there. According to historical accounts, they were subject to vivisection without anesthesia after they had been deliberately infected with diseases such as typhus and cholera. Some had limbs amputated or organs removed. According to the list obtained by China's Harbin City, it's estimated that at least 3,000 prisoners were sacrificed with exact details of their heinous reality yet to be properly identified. Now, this is because Japan executed uh, a all surviving prisoners after the World War II was over uh, and also destroyed all evidence of their experiments conducted in what's called the horror bunker in order to erase the traces of their atrocities. Because all documents were destroyed, unit members uh, are presumed to have carried on with their lives, getting a job at a hospital or at pharmaceutical companies, even after committing brutal crimes. Researchers in Japan say the newly found list of names will be a major step toward unveiling more concealed facts and the lives of the members. Japan reluctantly acknowledged the unit's existence in the late 1990s, but has refused to discuss its activities. Instead, uh, accounts of the unit's activities have been built around testimonies from former members, photographs, and uh, documentary evidence. Yeah, and again, I mean, it's it's been mentioned in a number of documentaries I had a chance to uh, watch a lot of podcasts that I was able to hear but like you said it was only based on testimonies and there was no real evidence in regards to this and I want to mind, mind you uh, G- the Nazi Germany were also very much known to conduct a lot of these very heinous experiments right on, on the on the Jews and uh, I think this is the key uh, sentence here in order to erase the traces of their atrocities and unfortunately uh, erasing the atrocities itself is not you know enough right I mean it's always there's got to be some kind of evidence and this of course document is that evidence right now and I mean the fact of the matter is uh, no proper apologies in regards to this but just them conducting whatever they can to erase uh, their past atrocities and that things just don't really work this way it really is unfortunate but uh What's going to happen afterwards? Uh, Well, uh, chances are not a whole lot is what we're going to be seeing here. Uh, Let's move on to the economy this time after a marathon debate. Finally, South Korea having decided to raise next year's minimum wage by 2.5%. However, this decision has failed. Uh, to obviously completely satisfy both the labor and the business sectors. Uh, Hejong, you have the final uh, numbers for us. Right. The minimum wage for 2024 has finally be, been set at 9861 That's roughly $7.80 and an increase of 2.5% from this year's minimum wage. The decision was made early Wednesday morning by the Minimum Wage Commission after a record 110 days of negotiation. In the Minimum Wage Commission, the point of contention was deciding between the different rates proposed by the labor and business sides of the commission, with those advocating for workers initially suggesting a jump to above 12,000 won and the business side proposing a freeze. The final vote followed fierce debate with the hike to 10,000 won proposed by the labor side against a figure of 9,861. A key point of attention had been whether the 2024 minimum wage would surpass the 10,001 threshold for the first time, but the final decision fell short of the mark as the rate was set at 9,861 with 17 of the 26 votes in favor. The new minimum wage for next year is 241 higher than this year's 9,621 and translates into a monthly wage of a little over 2 million and 60,000 won, which is around $1,630. Now, once the commission submits the results to the Ministry of Employment and Labor, the new minimum wage will be finalized by August 5th. And as many as 3 million people are expected to be affected by the change, which will take effect on the first day of next year. 
The head of the Federation of Korean Trade Unions spoke out against the final decision, saying that the minimum wage increase did not meet the rates of inflation and would therefore be of little benefit to low-wage workers. However, the business representatives argued that a freeze was necessary to support small businesses that are struggling with the economic slowdown and that an increased minimum wage would ultimately result in job losses. Both sides can object to the agreement and, subject to the Minister of Labor's approval, can request a re-evaluation by the Commission. However, a re-evaluation has never occurred since the minimum wage system was introduced in 1988. Again, as we mentioned, I mean, this is uh, one of those issues where it's really hard to take one side over the other. And uh, if you remember, it was during the, I believe, uh, the previous Moon administration where one of the uh, the pledges by uh, then President Moon Jae-in uh, was to increase the minimum wage by 10,000 won. But again, that's easier said than done. But there was a number of issues at hand. And obviously, the business sector was very much against that. And even when they raised, uh, raised it a bit, I believe uh, just over 9,000 uh, Korean won, a lot of the smaller business owners mm-hmm. were unable to pay for the workers. And hence, what they did was there was a bunch of layoffs, uh, a bunch of them, uh, you know, especially convenience stores, I believe. They were basically uh, the owners themselves working long hours because they couldn't pay for the uh, the workers and so forth and so yes it doesn't meet the i guess uh, the level of inflation that we're seeing but on the flip side you raise it too much and it's also going to uh, lead to further inflation because all the restaurants and all the businesses they're gonna have to uh, you know raise their prices in order to kind of meet the the demand of the workers and so prices go up and then we're back to square one once again so uh, it is very difficult uh nanti asks seven dollars is per hour it's seven dollars and eighty cents i believe uh per hour is the minimum wage uh, for it next year. So that's again, I guess that's the, uh, the exchange rate uh, as of today here. We're going to move on. Uh, the Asia Development Bank slashing South Korea's growth outlook for this year from its previous forecast, citing lingering economic uncertainties. Uh, Tom, let's get the latest statistics on that. Sure, the ADB lowered its growth outlook for the South Korean economy to 1.3%, citing sluggish exports and investment. The Manila-based bank cut the growth rate by 0.2 percentage point from its previous forecast of a 1.5% growth for South Korea. The projection is lower than projections made by the South Korean government, which cut its growth forecast for this year by 0.2 percentage point to 1.4%. It's also lower than the forecast cast of the OECD, which cut its 2023 growth outlook for South Korea by 0.1 percentage point to 1.5 percent. According to ADB's analysis, Korea's growth this year will mark the lowest among major Asian economies, including China, Taiwan and Singapore. The revision came as Korea's export-driven economy continued to post sluggish outbound shipments despite some signs of recovery. Korea logged a trade surplus for the first time in 16 months in June, but its outbound shipments fell for the ninth consecutive month due mainly to weak demand for semiconductors. Outbound shipments fell 6% on year to around $54 billion last month, which marked the smallest on your export decline so far this year, possibly indicating that exports may rebound in the second half of this year. The ADB, however, maintained a 2.2% growth outlook for next year, and the bank expected prices in Korea to rise 3.5% on year uh, this year, up from its previous inflation projection of 3.2%. It cited the continued upward trend in consumer prices, despite indications of stability from the energy and food sectors. The Bank of Korea kept its key interest rate unchanged at 3.5% last week, freezing rates for the fourth straight time. It is quite ironic in some ways because if you guys remember during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, it was actually South Korea uh, that was seeing in relatively good growth in the economy compared to some of the other uh, uh, economies uh, and uh, the economy was looking so much stronger than even compared to like the United States, uh, China and so forth and some of the other major economies uh, which shows you 
uh, how reliant the South Korean economy is on the exports because at the time it was during the COVID-19 pandemic that there was a huge demand for semiconductors hence you know with all those exports going out but now there is this weak demand for semiconductors not surprising that we are uh, continuing to see a downward revision uh, from a number of agencies not, not just the Asian Development Bank but a number of agencies have uh, revised down South Korea's uh, growth outlook for this year as well let's move on another topic uh, that we've been covering all throughout the last week and this week as well uh, is on the deadly torrential rain that uh, slammed the central and southern regions. Uh, of course, those two regions being hit the hardest uh, during the recent uh, downpours here. For a swift recovery, in these area state funds will be on their way uh, in order to, uh, to the affected local governments and individuals in the 13 areas that are now classified as special disaster zones. Uh, Hejun, let's get the latest on this. All right. Today, President Yoon Seo Gyeol designated 13 areas hit hard by deadly downpours as special disaster zones, including the central cities of Cheongju and Gongju. Also on the list are Yecheon in North Gyeongsang Province, Nonsan in South Chungcheong Province, and Iksan in North Jeolla Province. Many of these areas have suffered greatly from fatal landslides or flooding due to the heavy rain, and the designations make the areas eligible for the government's financial support and recovery work, relief funds for victims, Victims and other benefits. The government explained that the reason the decision was made before the central investigation had been finalized was based on the judgment that preemptive government action is necessary to quickly repair the damage. And the director general at the Ministry of Interior and Safety mentioned that, quote unquote, when a large scale disaster strikes, local governments can only recover so much with their own budgets, which is why we support them as a central government so that they can get back to normal as soon as possible. And up to 80% of the damage recovery costs will be funded by the state in special disaster zones. In addition to su state support for local governments, help will be offered for individuals in the affected areas. This includes po postponements on tax and discounts on utility bills, and the residents will also get a discount on their health insurance fee and phone bill. For the areas that haven't been declared special disaster zones yet, the government said it plans to conduct damage analysis and make additional declarations if necessary. Again, it is really scary how volatile uh, the weather is because just last year and even at uh, the beginning of uh, this year, we were talking about the uh, the extreme drought that some of these southern regions were facing and even some parts of the, uh, the central region as well. And now uh, we're just seeing a complete polar opposite. But as we continue to keep a close tab on the matter, unfortunately, we are seeing a growing number of the death toll as well. Uh, the latest information that we have at this time is that the death toll from the torrential downpours have reached 45, uh, with six still account unaccounted for. Uh, we have over 30,000 troops have been dispatched to the flood and landslides ravaged areas uh, in order to search for the missing people. Don, let's get the latest on this. Well, let me start with uh, breaking news. Another missing victim, a female uh, believed to be in her 50s, was found in Yecheon, uh, North Gyeongsang province at around 5 p.m. So that's just about an hour ago, raising the total death toll to 46. Uh, and this, uh, and she was uh, found after one missing victim in his or her 70s was found also in Yecheon at 11 a.m. this morning. So the central disaster Disaster Agency's official tally uh, stood at 44 as of 6 a.m. this morning. Uh, but after uh, the recovery of the two uh, victims in Yecheon, the death toll uh, has now risen to 46. Uh, and also in Yecheon today, one Marine went missing uh, during search and rescue operation. Three Marines were swept away by fast current. Uh, two of them managed to swim out of the water, but one Marine failed to do so. Uh, and was swept away by the rapids and disappeared. The Marine, known only as a corporal belonging to the 1st Marine Division, uh, disappeared into the rapids
limits of the Daesong stream in Yecheon, some 160 kilometers southeast of Seoul, uh, this morning. Some 32,000 troops have been dispatched to regions battered by flooding and landslides, while more than 1,200 military equipment uh, were deployed to find the remaining missing victims. The record-breaking downpours forced nearly 16,500 people to evacuate, thousands of whom are yet to return home. More than 31,000 hectares of farmlands are estimated to have been submerged from floodings across Chungcheong and Gyeongsang, as well as Jeolla provinces. That's larger than half of the whole of Seoul City. And really, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, we talk about those missing, and uh, some of them have been missing for a while now, and uh, the consensus is that it's no longer a search and rescue operation, but a search and recovery uh, operation right now. We're going to finish things, you know, let's finish things off on a brighter note here. Uh, and this is good news, unless you're a Manchester United fan and a listener by the name of John Jang falsely uh, told me that Kim Min Jae was signing with Manchester United. That is not official now. It is official that Kim Min Jae, a South Korean defender and the top city uh defender last year. Uh, he is going to be moving to the German champions Bayern Munich. Uh, this, of course, from Italy's Napoli. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a record fee for an Asian footballer. $56.1 million uh, is the transfer fee that Bayern Munich is paying Napoli uh, in order to get the 26-year-old defender. Hejong, let's get the latest in the, the world of sports. Sure. South Korean defender Kim Min Jae has joined German football giant Bayern Munich, a move that ends weeks of speculation on the destination for the gifted center back. Bayern Munich announced Tuesday German time that they have signed Kim away from Serie A champion Napoli to a five-year contract, and Kim will be wearing number three. Kim was also named the best defender of Serie A, an honor that further drove up the stock for the 26-year-old. Though Bayern Munich didn't disclose the financial details of the deal, the transfer fee for Kim is believed to have been 50 million euros, about 56.1 million US dollars. That would be the biggest transfer fee for an Asian player in European football, surpassing the 30 million euros commanded by Tottenham Hotspur star Son Heung Min. And the five year deal will also pay him an annual salary of 13.4 million US dollars. Offering a rare combination of physicality, speed, and high end skills, Kim is considered one of the top center backs in Europe. He had also reportedly drawn interest from Manchester United in the Premier League, but ultimately signed for Bayern Munich, who has won the past 11 Bundesliga titles and has also collected multiple trophies at domestic cup competitions and continental events. And as his transfer became official, Kim Min Jae said that FC Bayern is a dream for every footballer and that he is really looking forward to what's to come in the future. I was looking at, uh, I was watching his interview. Uh, the the Bayern Munich uh, the social media team got to uh, Kim Min Jae as he was doing the stationary cycling or something like that, warming up for some kind of training. And then it was like, Kim Min Jae speaks English, by the way, uh, because of his time like in uh, Turkey and uh, also in uh, Italy and so forth. And so they're saying, hey, you know, how do you feel about joining Bayern Munich? He says, oh, this is a, a, green, a dream come true. This is a great team, but I'm really shy right now. <laughs> was his comment. So, you know, you're not going to get a whole lot of comments from Kim Min Jae, but uh, kudos to him. Uh, Bayern Munich certainly a very, very uh, good team and a good, good chance of winning maybe the Champions League, which is what all the uh, the players uh, definitely want to win, right? Nevertheless, guys, thank you very much for your reports today. Please stay safe and we'll see you guys again. Thank, thank you. you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.